uh, Pilate, he's up against it. He's right face to face with him in that context there. And Christ's about to be crucified. And three times, if you read that passage, three times, three times he says, I find no fault in him. Triple jeopardy. He's tried three times. And after being tried three times, triple jeopardy, and saying, I find no fault in him, he has him crucified. That is some judge. Must be like a judge in the Supreme Court, one of those fellows. I know I'll talk about a miscarriage of justice. There's a man tried three times for the same offense, and every time the verdict is innocent. And then he has him crucified. That is some ruler there. Mob violence. The mob controlled the, the, the judge. Uh, he, he did this. He did that. He said, I find no fault in him. Says it once. I find no fault in him. Says it twice. You read the account. I find no fault in him. He says it three times. And then has him delivered. Now, I call your attention to the text that says, Behold the man. Oh, uh, that's a man saying that. Uh, that's not like some teenage rock opera about you, the superstar, you know. And that's a man. That's a grown Roman governor. A, a, governor, a, a governor in the military army occupation is not a Girl Scout. <laughs> and when he stands up and he says, Behold the man, that's the expression in the prison. The man, the man, the man. That's the, that's the man. That's the man. <laughs> yeah. That's, he's, he's, he's saying, like it's the only man, the only real man around. Yeah. Behold the man, yes, like that. So he's impressed. He's impressed. And that reminds me to say, which you'd think uh, shouldn't have to be said, but you have to say it, the fundamentalist. He was a man. Yes, sir. Amen. Now, see, I believe in the deity of Christ. I'm no, I'm no uh, heretic. I believe that he was God manifest in the flesh. Sure, I believe that. Uh, I throw out the new Bibles because they have passion that attack his deity. Uh, a fundamentalist, a fundamentalist who believes the fundamentals of the Bible and the faith, uh, you know what the gospel he likes the best? John. You know why? Because John presents Christ as deity. You take Matthew, he presents Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. You take Mark, he presents Jesus Christ as a servant with no genealogy, no record of birth. And Luke presents him as the son of man. So he traces his genealogy to Adam. That's the first man. But when you get to John, he got a genealogy, but it ain't human. You get, to, you get to John in the beginning was the Word, and the Word with God, and the Word was what? Ah. Yeah, like that. Yes, sir. Amen. So you see, manifest say that's the thing he likes. Yes, he likes the thing because after all, John was written, and John was written. John says he was written for that purpose. John says, "I'm writing uh, these, I believe things I write to you that you may believe that he's the Son of God, and believe that you might have life through his name." So I'm not a modernist. I'm not a liberal. I believe in the deity of Christ. But we have a fault, most fundamentalists. We get the fault where we forget that he was a man. For him to show up on a throne, he showed up at a barn. They looked for him to come down on a white charger. That's why the Jews didn't accept him. They had the uh, Old Testament, which second advent. They had a picture of him coming on a white horse, see? Which he will come. <laughs> but when he shows up on a donkey, they're not ready for it. You see? And uh, no, no gradual descent, no coming down from the ivory palaces and coming down for a while and being king of the universe and then coming down to Mars and being capital of the, uh, the capital of the solar system and then coming down and being Caesar for a while and then coming down and being the chief rabbi for a while and then finally coming down to the prophet. There's no gradual ascent. He steps out of heaven's eternal daylight, earth's midnight, and shows him at a barn when a woman is about to go through the most dangerous part of her life and bring him forth in a, in a, in a hayloft in a barn with a smell of camels and goats in it. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Yes, I like that. Yes, See, I don't understand God. Right. I've been saved over, I've been saved now over, oh, way up in that 57 years someplace. I still don't understand God. Amen. I can't figure him out. <laughs> but when I'm presented with the man, I can get that. See? He was a man just like I'm a man. Do yeah. uh, you ever cry? Yes, sir. Jesus wept. Yeah. Did you ever get hungry? Yeah, sir. He got hungry. Did you ever get thirsty? He said, lady, give me a drink. Did you ever get tired? Yeah. He fell asleep in the back end of a boat. Went on a fishing trip. Wore out. <laughs> God don't wear out. <laughs> Why, do you think God ever gets thirsty? Do you think he ever gets hungry? Of course not. He said, he said, he, back in the song, he's talking about himself. 
He said, if I own, I own the cattle in a thousand hills, cattle in a thousand hills, and if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. That's right. <laughs> I like that. I like that saying. If I was, what are you, what are you going to do for God? What are you going to do for God? Yeah. Nothing, nothing, brother, nothing. Yeah. If he, anything he's done, he's going to do it for you. <laughs> but as a man, do you think it didn't hurt his feelings to be valued at 17 bucks? That's what about 30 pieces of silver was in those days. Of course, that'd be more now. Now it'd be about 50 bucks. But if the, the shepherd said to the sheep, what do you think I'm worth? I'm your pastor. I'm your shepherd. What do you think I'm worth for a salary? Zechariah. And they said, 30 pieces of silver. Brethren, that's the price of a female slave in the Old Testament. Yes, Amen. Now, wouldn't you get a little bit offended by like that if the people you're taking care of minister to a shepherd valued at that? 17 bucks. He was a man. A man. The Bible said, ye through his poverty might become rich. So when Pilate says, behold the man, then he's, uh, he's talking about a real man. And, uh, and along this line, we're talking about behold the man. Uh, I want to say certain things about him. And the first thing I want to say about him is behold his life. No life lived like this one. There's absolutely none to compare with it. There never has been, there never will be. When you talk about, well, Buddha was the founder of Buddhism, and uh, Muhammad founded Islam, and Jesus Christ founded Christianity. And, uh, and you say, well, Muhammad recognized him as a prophet. Well, that's just kid stuff. Amen. Muhammad's life alongside his. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, okay? Or any man's life alongside his. Don't be ridiculous. He has four biographers, eyewitnesses. Amen. You haven't got four. He's got four. You know what they say? They say he's sinless. Amen. Hanging on the cross, you know what the centurion says after watching that thing? This man truly was the son of God. Yes, you know what Judah says after selling him out? I betrayed the innocent blood. You know what Pilate says after examining him that you never have examined him? I find no fault in him. I bet I could find some faults with you. Yes, I bet he could find some faults with me. You can't get a life like that. Yes, Come on, show me one. You know something about history? Give me one life like that. Oh, well, so-and-so was a great teacher too like that. <laughs> he ain't a great teacher if he isn't God. If he isn't God manifest the flesh, he's a lying crook and ought to be crucified. Yeah. Amen, 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 amen. The idea of a man stepping up and saying, come unto me, all ye the labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, if he couldn't do it. That's right. That's good, brother. Amen. I mean, suppose I came here one day to preach, and you saw one of my students come down and bat down the floor in front of me and say, my Lord, my God. <laughs> That's what happened to him. Yeah. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. Down he goes, and Jesus says, let's keep laying there. You're doing fine. Yes, sir. Yeah. He encouraged worship. Yes, sir. After that storm at sea was over, the Bible said they came and worshiped him, right. and he didn't rebuke any of them. Amen. Right. Now, tell me another life like that. You can't do it. Uh, how does your life match alongside his life? That spirit of hard work. I mean, day and night with mobs following and no privacy, no privacy. Mobs all the time, people after him all the time, day and night thronging against him. Everybody wanting something. Everybody claiming something. That, that spirit of hard work, that spirit of patience. Little kids running around bothering, making a racket, and he'd say, suffer little children coming to me and forbid them not. That spirit of forgiveness. Yeah. Hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Does that remind you of you? It don't remind me of me. I know how we talk. Oh, boy, if somebody said somebody like that, may I know. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm, I know you. <laughs> Not this one here. Oh, I asked of Muhammad one time about a verse in Scripture that said, uh, do good to your enemies, you know, overcome evil with good. And he said, that's all right, but he said, but it doesn't work. <laughs> he didn't believe in forgiving his enemies. He believed in killing them. Yeah. He says, forgive them. His enemy... The ones that had him killed, he said, forgive them. Does that sound like Muhammad? I don't think so. You couldn't find a life like this if you looked all day and all night for the rest of your life. You couldn't find a life like this one. This is, uh, this is he said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. The only beloved. Behold his life. Nothing like him. What about the Pope is like Christ? <laughs> Name me one thing. 
Can you imagine Christ stepping out of an airplane and somebody rolling out a, a red carpet for him to come down, you know, with all the, everybody taking pictures of him and his little old half a grapefruit on top of his head, itty meeny miny mo, all this kind of stuff coming across there. And then getting up talking about peace, peace, yeah. peace, peace, peace. <laughs> Jesus shows up and they say, peace, peace. And he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Amen. How many of you read that? Could I see your hands? That ain't no pope. You know Jesus Christ talking about peace for anybody. You got the revel at John chapter 17. He said, I pray not for the world. Are you praying for world peace? Well, don't waste your breath and mine, okay? And don't waste God's time with a lot of trivia. God got three world wars on deck, three of them. Lock, load, and fire, boy. So, Ruckman, how you talk? No, no, how you don't read that book. Amen. There's a war coming up in Revelation chapter 6 after the saints are caught out and to take peace from the earth and a red horse coming out there killing them right and left and a third of the men killed in that thing. You're going up into, into a billion people. There's a war when Christ comes back in Armageddon, Revelation chapter 19, and at the end of the millennium there's another war with Gog and Magog in Revelation chapter 20. There are three of them coming up. If you're praying for peace on earth, you're praying outside the will of God. <laughs> Boy, tell that to them, the UN or Washington, these positive thinking people. Peace, peace, peace. There is no peace. There's no peace to the wicked, saith my God. That's the business. All right. He says, uh, Behold the man, behold his, uh, behold his life. That's good, now something else. Behold his friends. Did anybody in the world have friends like this one? I um, mean, you just don't often stop to think about it, but commercial fishermen, uh, do you know many commercial fishermen? <laughs> I mean, I've known them up down this coast here at Destin and Panama City and been out with them and been below salt, old, old salts of the first water, and I mean salt water. I know that bunch out there that have been out there in that ocean there for 40 and 50 years, and they're, they're, they've been out there for so long they look like a, they look like a, a red snapper. <laughs> those guys carry uh, fillet knives with them about that long. And they get in those boats, and sometimes it gets, gets kind of bad. <laughs> That's a rough crew. That's a rough crew. You ever met the Munn family? Harry and uh, Harry Munt and Wayne Munt and his daddy. Did you ever meet his daddy? Meet the old man. About six feet four, about 300 pounds, and hands, boy, just the, the inside of the hand, just like sandpaper from pulling wet ropes at night in the winter for 50 years. That's a fine bunch of friends you've got, Christ. <laughs> Not even very good a bunch of seminary graduates you've got there. Listen, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wasn't a, a, he wasn't a butterfly collector, he was a lion tamer. And they always picture him as kind of an effeminate kind of a character, you know, with, with, with nicey, nicey ways. Commercial, listen, commercial fishermen and construction men and infantrymen are not nice little boys. And if you don't know that, you ain't been nowhere. His friends. Uh, Jesus, what a friend of sinners. What a friend we have in Jesus. Hey, man, if you're here tonight and you're unsaved, I want to ask you a question. If God can trust him with your salvation, how come you can't? That's good. If God could trust his son with your soul, you mean to tell me you can't trust him with it? Who the blankety-blank are you? You think you're God? I uh, just, just common sense, see? There ain't nothing religious about this kind of stuff. God said, that's the mediator right there. I trust him with your salvation, and if you come by him, I'll take you, and if you don't, I won't. Now, what are you going to do? You can't trust him. Why can't you trust him? Come on, you male here. Why can't you trust him? What, what, is, what do you ever do? Did you ever steal your wife? Did you ever mess up your daughter or your sister? Did you ever borrow money and not pay it back? What did you ever do? Take the base plate line off so he could get some property that wasn't his? What do you ever do? What, what do you ever do against you? Nothing, nothing. Why can't you trust him? Old class distinction. Oh, cut it out, cut it out. He didn't even have a place to sleep at night. Born in a barn. Poor, common, ordinary man. That kind of, and you can't trust him? Why can't you trust him? Jesus, what a friend of sinners. A little girl came on home one time, daily vacation, Bible school, and the mother had never been there and had the bus pick the little girl up and asked the little girl when she got back what was it like. She's always good 
She was real good. I really liked it. So what they talk about? And he said, they talked about me. And I said, she said, you about you? And this little, her, her, little girl's name was Edith. And she said, well, they didn't say Edith, did they? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, they showed me where Edith was in the Bible. And she said, well, that couldn't be. What, what do you mean? She said, well, they said, Jesus Christ received the sinners and Edith with them. <laughs> now, uh, she had a <coughs> her spelling a little off there, you see. But, uh, but he received sinners and Pete Ruckman with him. I'm one of his friends. You, now, you might think I'm your enemy. That's true. That's very true. But I'll tell you one thing. You never mistake me for his enemy. You never mistake me for his enemy. I make sure of that. You know why I'm as crude and crude and vulgar and country as I am? So you never mistake me for one of his enemies. His enemies were highly educated. And they were religious. And that's where I was raised with that crowd. I'm a reactionary. My, my ministry is bending overboard to be just the opposite from what you think a Christian ought to be. So uh, you don't get me confused. What a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, you, take the, you take the friends. Did you, ever, did you ever start thinking about his company he kept? Where, where is he after? Here he still, he still is a storm, a storm out at sea. There's a, a typhoon out there and he's standing at the boat and says, Shut up! <laughs> That's the original Greek. <laughs> Shut up, he says. <laughs> and the whole thing just goes down and gets quiet and flat as a leak. And where is he after that? Why is he on CBS and NBC? Why isn't Caesar coming over there to see what happened? Why isn't Pilate saying, how'd you do it? And now we take you to Peter. And Thomas, did you see him do it? And now we take you to Rome. And He's back there lying down with a pile of dead fish sleeping. You ever think about that? Here he is walking along the road to Emmaus, you know. Just after accomplishing the greatest feat the world's ever seen, pulled himself out of the dead after three days. And he's walking along there. What manner of communications are these you have as, as you walk by the way and are sad? Art thou a stranger only in Jerusalem and have not known the things that have come to pass there in those days? No. What things? Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. Yes, what, a, what a strange character. Yes, I mean, why, why are all the reporters? Why, where are all the, all the big shots? The big shots are never there. That's right. yeah. He spent his whole life with little shots. To a road to mass, that's a small, you don't even know the name of one of them. One of them's clear because you don't know who the other one was. That's the kind of business. I mean, what take you take you take a thing like that in the in the uh, in, after raising Lazarus from the dead? Did you know it's not not just every man that go out in the graveyard and haul a fellow up that's been dead for four days? <laughs> it don't happen regularly, you know. <laughs> and up come the dead, and where is he the next day? Where is he? Is he down with the pilot and said, I did it this way, and if you'll do it this way, and if you'll believe it, he hadn't given Pilate the time of day. They said, don't you know Herod's out to get you? He said, tell that old fox I'm going three more days. He wouldn't even talk with him, the governor, when he had a chance to. They weren't his friends. You know where he is sitting on a table with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead? Please pass the salt. you like some more cornbread? Thank you. Have some more butter. My tea. Help yourself. Ain't that something? I'm not one of his enemies. I'm one of his friends. I'm not with him. I stand to stay down there with him. And I know the crowd. And you're never going to think I'm one of them. And I'm going to see to it that you don't. Every now and then, God lets some handfuls of purpose fall my way, which he doesn't give to other preachers. I don't know why it is, but uh, I'm kind of one of his spoiled kids. A lot of things happen in my ministry that uh, just don't happen to other preachers, that's all. And some of my, uh, I, you couldn't say proud, but my favorite moments have been things that have come up that wouldn't come up in the life of any preacher. God just gives me a little handful of purposes along the way all the time that other preachers just don't get. Like one night here, oh, it's been years ago now, and I was passing over there at Brent. Yeah, I was passing over there at Brent, and one night I got a telephone call about, oh, about 11 o'clock at night. And the old boy's drunk. He's a guy I used to drink with before I was saved. And he was crying over the telephone. He said, uh, he come on by here to talk to me and my wife. He's trying to talk to my wife, you know. He said, we're breaking up. He said, you give us some help. I said, oh, yeah, I'll be by. 
So I got there and drove there. I got there about 12 o'clock at night. When I got by there and came by the place, I got up and knocked the door. The door opened the door, and he opened the door. And he was crying, he opened the door. I could see his wife sitting on the sofa behind him. A fellow about, oh, about 55 years old. And he opened the door like this. When I stepped in, he grabbed me by the, oh, the, the lapels and said, Show me Jesus, Pete. Show me Jesus. How would you like that put on you at 12.30 at night? <laughs> Show me Jesus. I just happen to have a total like it is in my pocket. And there just happened to be a picture like the one I'm drawing right now. And I pulled out and I said, there, right there. And that bird dropped his knees right on the floor in front of me. So I dropped with him and led him to Christ. And he got saved. The old boy got saved. And when he got saved, when I looked up, his wife sitting over there, her face just white, you know. And he said, talk to my wife now. Please talk to my wife. Amen. So I sat down next to her. I said, sister, are you saved? She said, well, I'm an Episcopalian. Uh, yes. I said, well, I was Episcopalian too before I was saved. Are you saved? She said, but I, have, I was christened. I said, I was christened too before I was saved. Yeah, yeah. Are you saved? And she said, but I had a godfather and a godmother. I said, so did I. And that old drunk began to laugh. <laughs> And he said, something I'll never forget. He said, there I told you, Pete Ruckman would tell you the deep black truth. <laughs> That's, right. That's the first time I've heard the word damn connected with the truth. <laughs> but that guy said, I'll tell you, Pete Ruckman would tell you the damn truth. <laughs> now, that would mean not some of you at all. But I got my own special way of doing things, boy. And listen, I wouldn't take a pretty for that. That's right. I wouldn't take 20,000 bucks for that. You know why? That old bum had confidence in me. Yes, sir. And he knew if any preacher in this town would cut a corner, he knew which one wouldn't. Amen. Come on. I told you he'd tell you the deep black truth. <laughs> you could get me to trade that for five degrees from any university in the world. I'll tell you another one. Both of you guys are drunk. I got, I got my best responses from drunks. <laughs> I preached for the rescue mission in Mobile, Alabama. And I preached over, I got through one night preaching over there, and, and going out the door, a bum came up to me with about three sheets in the wind, two of them blown away. And he come up to me and he said, uh, he said, the preacher said, uh, he said, you remember me? And I said, uh, no, I remember you. He said, well, I got to save your men here last year. <laughs> and I said, if you ain't doing so well, are you? <laughs> and he said, no, I ain't, preacher. Well, I'll tell you one thing, I'll have you know something. So I missed a freight train out of here tonight to hear you preach. Because you only fella I ever come to stand was plain enough, and I missed a train out of here to hear you preach. <laughs> I wouldn't make a million bucks for that. An old bum miss hopping a ride in a rail to hear me preach. I'd rather have that recommendation, a recommendation from Bob Jones and Billy Graham. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Just like I said it. Just like I said it. I get those things from time to time. Over my house, if you come over there sometime, you know what you'll see in the dining room? You'll see a plaque up there on the wall. And on that plaque, you know what you see on that plaque? You'll see three $1 bills and a $5 bill. That's been on the wall of my house for more than 25 years. And I've never spent it. If I was broke and had nothing left, that'd be the last money I'd spend. The eight bucks up there on the wall. And there's no way to explain it. I mean, uh, my brethren that are of my great Christian celebrities that have all the answers and Ruckman doesn't qualify for the ministry and all that blabber, they, they dismiss the blessings I get. You know what that thing is? That's out there at the Potigo Camp in uh, uh, Comfort, Texas, in Santa, near San Antonio. And out there in that uh, place in San Antonio with a, in Texas, uh, after a meeting one time, a bunch of little kids went back to the barracks. And the counselor wasn't there in charge of the barracks. And that barracks there had kids in it from about 8 to 12. And the counselor wasn't there. And the oldest kid there, about 11, well, 11 or 12 years old, about 11 years old, the oldest one they had, he had all those kids get around him and said, let's take up an offering for Brother Rupkin. They call me Rupkin, see. You get Rockman, Ruckman, Tuckman, Rubberman, Ruffman, Roofman, or everything else, you know, but uh, Rupkin. R U R U P, Rup, K I N, Rupkin. So that kid 
gets a pillowcase and they go around and the kids put all their change in it. The mama gave them for stuff down at the snack shop. And they take that chain down the snack shop and turn it in for bills and they come back with three one dollar bills and five dollar bills and give me the offering. And Lee Robertson and John R. Rice and Shelton Smith and Curtis Hudson and Austin and Billy Graham have, have never, not, had never, nothing like that happen in their lives. And they never will. I'm one of his friends. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Now, uh, behold the man, behold his friends uh, about this, behold his enemies. I mean, I, you know what I just said about them? I said they were rich. They were educated. And uh, they were religious. And uh, me, so I think it's like that. You'd be amazed how hard it is to talk and say one thing while you're writing something else. <laughs> So when you get home at night, you ought to do, you know what you ought to do? You ought to sit down at the table and practice quoting John 3.16 while you're writing Romans 6.23. It ain't easy. <laughs> now consider his enemies. And, uh, and, he, and he, had, he had real enemies. You know, about these friends. I think I got thinking about another one just now that I didn't tell you about. I've got over in my house there a plaque in the back uh, from some jailbirds in the Las Vegas prison out there. And they got their pictures on there. And one kid's got a big t-shirt on saying, Bible Thumper. <laughs> These are a bunch of boys, a bunch of Hispanics. Got, got a couple of drugs and stuff. And they got saved. And this guy's preaching the word to everybody over there. At the noon hour, and they all he get out in the square. Out after where they weren't eating. They got a little more freedom there to do some jails. And got out there and would preach at them while they're, while they're eating. And it's got a big line on it they made out of uh, horse hairs for his mane and stuff. And a picture of a King James Bible. And the bottom of the photograph it says, Thank God for getting me back in the book where I belonged. Amen. And then three jailbirds signed that thing. Amen. Oh. The Pope knows nothing about that at all. Right. No man ever wrote any Pope and thanked him for getting him back to any Bible. That's right. And never will. Those are little handfuls of purpose. Don't you worry about Ruckman. Lord, take care of them. Yes, sir. And every time something gets bad, you just take a little something and just go, yeah. a little something here and go, and, um, like this. His enemies, cruel, educated, <laughs> intellectual, intelligent, and they did, they they hated him, uh, hated him. They, they hated him so they weren't satisfied. They had the last drop of blood out of him. Right. And how was that? Then put him on the cross and not made fun of him and said. The, of this, he saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the Christ, if he will let him come down the cross, and we will, we will believe. Uh, rich folks, educated folks, up, upper crust, posh, the 400. I know where they are in this town. I know where they are. I know the doctor's wives and the lawyer's wives and the city councilmen and the people in this town. They're not different in this town than any other town. And you get, you get running devilment down, you run that bunch every time. Behold his enemies. Are you one of his enemies? You adulterers and adulterers, know you not that friendship for the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of this world is the what? Enemy. That's it. Enemy. Is that you? It ain't me. I'm one of his friends. Or right, now behold his enemies. Now that is no. Behold his death. One of the most terrible deaths a man could die. Trust, trust man to work out the, the wickedest, cruelest thing that not even an animal could think of. And this is one of the most horrible deaths you can die, a slow death by crucifixion. Many times when a man was crucified, he was hung, he stayed up on the cross for two or three days before he finally expired and the birds would come down and sit down and peck his eyes out while he was still alive. That kind of thing, that kind of a death. And a uh, uh, traumatic state all the time. And bones either broken or pulled out of joint. If they stayed on the cross on the wrong day, they broke the bones with a gas iron, with a piece of cast iron pipe. Broke the bones right across the shin, shin bone, to keep them hanging there so they wouldn't crawl away after they got taken off the cross. One of the most terrible means of death ever, ever devised by an unsaved man. And uh, behold his death, voluntary death, painful death, 
substitutionary death. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save the uttermost, all them that come unto God by him, seeing ye ever liveth to make intercession for them. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins. A, a painful death. A crown of thorns jammed down on his head. If you want to see what those thorns are like, I got some in my backyard that you just find there on the orange tree. And those uh, spikes are about that long. You make a wreath out of those things and jam it in the fellow's head. And the reason why they took a, a rod and beat it down on his head is because they couldn't do it with their hands. They'd cut their hands all to pieces. So after they got the wreath there and put it down on his head, they jammed it down there and smacked the thing down there with a bamboo rod. Uh, J Jesus Christ died for your sins. I a voluntary death, a painful death, a miserable death, and a substitutionary death. The Bible said this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinner of whom I am chief. chief. He says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. That's the business. Consider his death. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh, 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 where? What were the instruments of death at? The sum in his hands. He has holes in his hands. What the holes in his hands for? I picked up stuff I shouldn't have picked up. He got holes in his feet. What's that for? I walked place I had no business going. Amen, brother? Amen. Can't some of you can't say can't some of you say amen? amen. Ain't you been some place you had no business going? Amen. See those old feet right there? Those uh, Nine triple E's, like a frog's foot. <laughs> you know where they've been? Vegas, Key West, Frisco, Nuremberg, Betches Garden, Seoul, Manila, Hyderabad, Bombay, New York, Chinatown, two o'clock in the morning, wrong end of Honolulu, two o'clock in the morning, wrong end of Manila, two o'clock in the morning, I need a payment for my feet. I need a payment for my hands. What's the crown of thorns doing around his head? Don't you know? My sins of intellect. Thoughts that weren't right. Imagination of the heart that wasn't right. That's what. What's the spirit doing through the side? That's where your heart is. That's my sins of affection. I love things I had no business loving. Amen. Amen. Get inquired at the turkey farm on Thanksgiving afternoon here. I'm, you, sh you ought to, we ought to have something in common. <laughs> We're all sinners. We're all sinners. And when Christ died, he says, Christ died for our sins. This is a faithful saying with all acceptation that Christ Jesus died for sinners. He didn't come to save uh, the, the world system, the cosmos. He didn't come to set institutions free. He didn't come to help the oppressed minorities. He didn't come right to liberate you women, you know, or liberate the slaves, or, uh, you know, or help the oppressed minorities, you know. He didn't come for that. He came to, to save sinners. Amen. Are you a sinner? Amen. Like I tell them in the prison when I preach, I tell them if I could find a sinner, I'd have a good message for him. <laughs> but uh, it's awful hard to find sinners. That's why I like to preach in jails. You know why? I, I feel like I, I have more in common with them than I do in my own congregation. They know the sinners in prison. Now then they got a raw deal and a double deal and a crooked lawyer, yeah, and the judge wouldn't let the, I got I got the whole thing, see. The judge wouldn't let the evidence in, so I have a case, but every guy in there knows he's guilty of something. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good. Yeah. He was numbered with the sinners. Amen. The Bible said he was numbered with the transgressors. So if you're going to get saved, you know what you got to do? You got to number yourself for the transgressors, what you got to do. Uh, have you done that? Uh, on a hill far away, sit an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And you love that old cross, you do, do you? The dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. Exchange it someday for a crown. Uh, not unless you take your place there. You'll take your place with sinners if you're ever going to get saved. If you're ever going to get saved, you're going to have to take your place with thieves. Amen. The, first time I, the first thing I tell any bunch of prisoners in any jail I preach in, the first thing I tell them, I'm in the first thing, not the last thing. 
The first thing I tell a bunch of prisoners when I step into kind of a jail is there's just one difference between you and me. You got caught and I didn't. And uh, listen, listen, brother, sister, someday everybody's going to get caught. The trick is get to Christ as quick as you can so the stuff's covered. There isn't any question about you getting caught. Christ said, nothing done in the secret not to be known, nothing covered that won't be, uh, come out in, in clear, in, in, in light, nothing done in the dark that won't be revealed. You know what uh, Solomon says in the Old Testament? He says, uh, he says, God shall bring thee into judgment with every secret work, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You know what Paul says about these things in the New Testament? He says, uh, in the day that God shall judge, listen, the secrets of men... The secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. It's going to come out. There are people, got, there are people get away with sin down here. A lot of people get away with sin. You say, you be sure you're a fine job. Not always down here. I've heard them say, no such thing as a perfect murder. Sure there is. There have been a lot of murderers commit. They never caught the murder. They never did catch Jack the Ripper. And he's just one famous case. There are a lot of murders. There's murders going on right now. But the murder hadn't been caught yet. And sometimes they don't ever catch them. Sometimes they get the wrong man. But boy, oh boy, in the day of judgment, boy, the white throne judgment, up they come, boy, and then <laughs> be sure your sin will find you out. <laughs> so when Christ dies, he dies on the cross. And what does he die for? He dies for sin. He dies for sinners. He died for sins in the plural. Not just sin, the things that you do wrong. Not just that. He died for the thing in you that makes you do wrong. You say, what that, that's sin. You know what he says? He said, God hath made him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the rights of God in him. Are you saved? Amen. Now, did you notice I haven't said anything about the church this whole trip? Just all this talk I've talked to you. I never talk about any church saving you. Never talked about baptism saving you. I'm talking about somebody. The, the problem with us, brethren, is we're born wrong. We have to be born again. Right. Well, to be born again, somebody has to give birth to you. Amen. You can't get born until somebody gives birth. Got nothing to do with the church. Amen. Got nothing to do with religion. Amen. You take the seven most hellish, damnable ways, the quickest way to hell in the world are seven major religions. Protestantism. Catholicism, Greek Orthodox, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, that's the way to hell. That's right. Yeah. That's a set of stuff you're supposed to do to get there. Right. This ain't got nothing to do with nothing you're doing. Amen. This has got something to do with what he's doing. That's right. You know what he's doing? He's dying for your sins. I do not know the depths of Jesus' love that brought him down to earth. From heaven above, nor why he bore the cross up Calvary and shed his precious blood so willingly. But this one thing I know, that when the crimson flow dropped to the earth below, it fell on me. My eyes were open wide, I saw him crucified, and knew for me he died on Calvary. I do not know what I can do or say, my debt of gratitude to him to pay. But I at least may cry, O oh Lord divine, had I a thousand lives, t'would all be thine. For this one thing I know, that when the crimson flow dropped to the earth below, it fell on me. My eyes were open wide, I saw him crucified, and knew for me he died on Calvary. Now you say, you say, Ruck, when are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. You say, how do you know it? I'm covered. Amen. 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 You got any coverage? There's no religion there. 
There's a blood covering. There's no church there. I talked to Campbellite one time and about being saved, and I said, now, suppose I was here at church. Could you tell me how to get saved? He said, oh, yes. So I said, well, how long have you been preaching? He said, 22 years. And I said, well, what, what must I do to get saved? He said, you'd have to confess, believe, repent, and be baptized. <laughs> and I said, have you repented? He said, yes. I said, you believed? He said, yes. I said, you've uh, uh, confessed? Yeah, you've been baptized? Yes. I said, are you saved? He said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that weird? I mean, suppose I said to you, I said, how do I get to Panama City? And you said, we take this one here and go left here and go right here and turn and turn down here. And I said, did you do that? He said, yeah. I said, well, did you get to Panama City? He said, well, I hope so. <laughs> you know, America, the dumbest people in the world spiritually. <laughs> Do you realize, you realize in this country, every Sunday morning, there is in America, well over 100,000 people meeting in church buildings here, a preacher tell them how to get to heaven, and the sucker don't know he's going to himself when he dies. What you putting money in the plate for, stupid? Yeah. That's good. If he don't know how to get himself there, you think he knows how to get you there? So people are. Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save the uttermost all them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make an intercession for them. Well, that fellow put out that, uh, that thing, uh, all the passion of Christ, you know. And people are getting shocked at that in the movies and getting told what a terrible thing. Well, listen, I've done this thing here for over 50 years all over this country. Uh, you know what it means? It means that you got a whole bunch of Americans where the preachers haven't been telling about this, and the first time they see it, they're shocked. Yeah. That's right. that's it. Well, that's just daily bread, brother. Right. I mean, Paul says, I reject by your rejoicing, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. Amen. Nevertheless, I live, yet not me, but Christ liveth in me. It's a daily thing. Uh, that movie had a lot of mess ups in it. Naturally, it would. It was put together by a Catholic. And the priest prayed before they took each shot, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I think it did some good. I really do. I pray, I appreciate it. I wouldn't do a thing like that myself, but I think God used it. And uh, woke up some people to the fact that the, the, the crucifixion I took place and it was a terrible, horrible thing, and it's connected with salvation. Now, there may be other things they didn't get right, and maybe they never will get right. I don't know. But I know one thing. Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And Paul said, if any man preach any of the gospel in that, you know what he said? He said, let God curse him. Let God curse him. All right, finally I say this. I say behold, behold his influence. Where would you find the influence of any man on earth like this one? Well, you couldn't find it. I know the, uh, the uh, Muhammad and the Muslims uh, they still have their way of their dating things from something Muhammad did, so it contradicts the uh, time, but all their mail has got uh, 2006 on it now. It isn't by Muhammad at all. Any Muslim over here in America who gets a marriage license or a wedding license or a hunting license, a fishing license, has to celebrate Jesus Christ's birthday That's to get right. his license. That's right. Amen. 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 That's right. Can you find, listen, can you find me a man, just, just, I'm, I'm, I'm open to these things, just show me the evidence. Can you find a man on this earth whose birthday is celebrated 50 million times a day? Well, 2006, dating from when? Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Before that's B.C., before Christ. That must drive atheists crazy to have to keep dating their birthday by Christ's birthday. That must, that's why they don't want you to celebrate Christmas. They want to have you forget when he was born. Yeah. Hey, man, we wouldn't, know, we wouldn't know how old you were if we didn't have Jesus Christ. Your, your, time, your year is devoted by, is by when he showed up. Yeah. Every newspaper in the world uses that dating system right. from his birthday. Every magazine. Own Europe. South America. Central America, Mexico. You want a driver's license? His birthday. Right. Hunting license? His birthday. Fishing license? His birthday. Marriage license? His birthday. Publish a magazine? His birthday. Publish a book? His birthday. Hey, boy, how's that for influence? Mm -hmm. Is that pretty tough? Imagine you talking about, uh, about Peter the Great and uh, Gregory the Great, you know, and those fellows. 
of somebody who's always the great, Alfred the Great. I, I want, why don't you say Jesus the Great? <laughs> I mean, you don't say you don't sell your, your your birthday by any birthday, but his. Oh my, what an influence! Now let me say this in closing: If you're here tonight and you haven't had a head on with collision with Jesus Christ, you are not saved no matter who tells you what. Because there's no salvation in things. I'll say it again. There's no salvation in things. You say what? Like the sacraments. You say like what? Like the golden rule. You say like what? The feast of Ramadan. You say like what? Lourdes and Fatima. There's no salvation in things. Salvation is in a person. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And that man said, no man, no man come to the Father except by me. That's the thing. And once you have a run in with Jesus Christ, you're never going to be the, be the same. You say, well, Ruckman, I still see him. I know, I know. I'm an old dog. I've been around a long time. I know, I know the ropes. I know how it is. But you're never, you're never the same. There's something different. Something changed that stays changed. You don't enjoy sin like you used to. And when you do enjoy it, you got a guilty conscience about it while you're doing it. Amen. And before you got to save, you find some way to get it with you. You find some way to alibi it. Right. But not after you save. Right. After you save, it's awful hard to convince yourself That's right. that it ain't wrong when you know it is. <laughs> if any man is in a Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. That's the business. You take, uh, you know, one time uh, many, many, many years ago, I was over in the Philippines. I was over in the Philippines and uh, I was drunk and painting while I was drunk. And I painted a picture of the, law, of the Last Supper with all the disciples drunk. And I had Jesus drunk. I had him passed out at the table. I had vomit all over the table and Simon Peter's feet sticking out of the table, you know, and John sitting there with his eyes crossed, you know. I took that thing around the shoulders of the GIs. It, it, it terrified them. It terrified them. <laughs> now they weren't any more saved than I was, but they were religious. And I wasn't even religious. I'd show up and say, hey, look at that. Ain't that, ain't that a ripper, brother? Oh, a Ruckman, a Ruckman. There's some things that just ain't funny. They'd say, well, they go, <laughs> look at that, you know. I'm not just ir irresponsive, blasphemous devil boy. I didn't care. Shook him up. And I got saved. <laughs> Amen. And I got saved, boy. And the, one of the first things I did when I got saved, I was up in Dixon Mills, Alabama. And I had to paint a baptistry for a, for a fellow named Roy McCallum. He was one of, uh, one of J. Frank Norris' graduates out there at the seminary in Fort Worth. I was going to paint a bath up there, and I got all my uh, turps together, my, my brushes, you know, and rags and stuff. Got in the baptistry and knelt down the baptistry, got on my knees and held my stuff out like this and to ask God to bless my brushes. And I started here, and the Lord said, Hey, you remember that picture back in the Philippines? And I said, uh, Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Lord said, do you see any reason why I shouldn't take your hands off the wrist right now? And I said, no, no. <laughs> Honest to God, I was near that I thought a buzz saw was going to come through there and take him right off. I could see it coming. <laughs> and the Lord said, okay, you learn your lesson now, you can draw for me. So I've been doing it for 57 years. You say, what is that? Influence, boy. Influence. Sure did something to me. I serve a risen Savior in the world today. I know he's living. No matter what they say. I haven't seen him. I wish to God I could show him to you. I've done the best I can. That ain't an idol of worship. That's just some illustration. I think, he ain't a face on a piece of paper. That's just an illustration. I wish I could say, you see him right there. Well, he's here. He's in the world today and convicted men of sin because they believe not on him. Now, how does it stand with you? How does it stand with you? Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day from the dead according to the scriptures. Wherefore, he's able to save to the uttermost all them that come to God by him, seeing ye ever liveth to make intercession for them. Father, bless your word tonight. May the Holy Spirit deal and convict of sin, rights, and judgment. Do his office work in our midst. 
And I pray when we go home tonight, we'll go home. Uh, everybody in this building, a happy band of saved people prepared to die and prepared to meet the judgment. Us tarry in prayer. A few minutes, we're going to stand and sing an invitation in a minute. And before we stand and sing, I want you to understand fully what I'm telling you. Uh, at this time, I am not giving an invitation for anybody to join a church. I get sick and tired of these mixed invitations where you don't know what you're doing and then it comes out some way you didn't expect. My invitation in a minute is going to be for anybody in this building. Are you listening? For anybody in this building that knows you're a sinner. You know you are a sinner. And you're not prepared to die and meet God in your sins. And you want to come tonight just to confess Christ as your Savior and let this crowd know that tonight you are accepting His Son as your Savior. That's going to be the invitation. I want to give you a little while to think about it. Pray about it. I bet there's some wet hands in this building right now. Wet hands in the palm. And right now, somebody here in this building, the devil has sat right next to you and said, Listen, you can't live it. You can't live it. You can't live it. Folks call you hypocrite if you don't live it. And he's trying to talk you out of it. Now tonight we stand and sing. I'm not gonna, we're not going to sing long. I don't have long invitations. I think we'll sing two stanzas. Then we're going to close. And this invitation is for any sinner in this building. Big, little, white, black, brown, chartreuse, indigo, cobalt, blue. Any sinner in this building who knows that you're not able to pay for your sins yourself and you'll accept God's payment for them, will you come forth the invitation and confess Jesus Christ as your, your, your Savior for yourself? Father, bless the invitation and speak to the soul that's near as hell tonight. We don't know who's going to be dead and who's not going to be dead this year, but if you know somebody that's close to the door or not ready, we pray you might deal with them now. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What number is that, brother? 243. 243. Let's take our hymnals and let's turn to 243 in the hymnal. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. We'll sing two stanzas. The invitation is, Whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. All right, let's sing it out.
See who bears the awful load. Tis the word, the Lord's anointed Son of Man and Son of God. the 